All right, thanks for joining me. Uh, first, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Dr. Stuart Ellis Gorman. I did my PhD at Trinity College in Dublin, finished it back in 2016. It was on the technological development of the bow and the crossbow in later medieval Europe. And then I spent a bit of time finding a real job. And then I just the last couple of years wrote a new introductory history to the crossbow, looking mostly at the European crossbow called the medieval crossbow, a weapon fit to kill a king. So what is the, the quick history of the crossbow? I think most people think of it as kind of a later medieval weapon, but its history is a lot earlier than that, isn't it? Yeah, so like many great technologies, its origins are in ancient China. So the earliest reference, the earliest really solid evidence we have for the crossbow is uh, very ancient China. So they're in the, ter the terracotta army has crossbowmen in it with very detailed surviving crossbows in it. And the earliest text reference we have to crossbows is in Sun Tzu's The Art of War where he uses it as kind of like a metaphor. It's not really a, a tactical crossbow use. It's, he compares something to a spanned crossbow. And mm -hmm. that kind of implies that it's actually much older even then if he's using it as a metaphor rather than it's not like the brand new thing. Yeah. So it has this very ancient Chinese technology use. And from there it spread in East Asia. So we know it spread to Korea and then down to what would be modern day Vietnam and Thailand. It's European history is a bit messier. So in China, it has this origin in kind of fifth, sixth century BC, maybe even earlier. And it's mm -hmm. used well for at least the next thousand plus years, very steadily in Chinese warfare. In Europe, it's much messier because we don't really get any evidence for it until this Roman writer called the Gedeus writes this manual of war in the fourth century AD. So we're already like nearly a thousand years after its invention, more than a thousand years after its invention. And he kind of uses these confusing terms, manubalista and archibalista, which kind of roughly translates to bow ballista, man ballista, but ballista is a big siege weapon. So it's it's somewhat split if he, if he means like a little ballista, like a crossbow, because a crossbow looks like a little ballista or like just a small ballista. But we have a few artistic references to it in the early middle ages. Uh, there's a couple of carvings in Roman era Gaul, kind of fourth, fifth, sixth century. Uh, and then there's a Pictish standing stone that's probably around eighth century, but they're tricky to date. So it could be, you could plus or minus 200 years really on that. And then it's from then we kind of get it in the Middle Ages. Um, it kind of really begins appearing in our sources from the 11th century. And it kind of becomes what we think of as the crossbow, this ubiquitous weapon of European warfare. But it's got this much older origin. And there's also this whole side argument about is the European crossbow, because when we get to the 11th century European crossbow, it's very different from the ancient Chinese crossbow and how it works. And so mm -hmm. there's a bit of a debate of is, is it an independent invention or is it just this is what 1500 years worth of kind of messing around has produced and we're kind of missing all the interstitial steps between the Chinese crossbow and this European one. Um, so most people kind of think of it as like a, a linear evolution where you go from the bow and arrow to the crossbow and then then eventually replace with guns but uh, these these weapons that are used kind of overlap quite a bit didn't they? Yeah so they would have had very extensive overlapping I mean just quickly jump back to the ancient Chinese example is really interesting because the ancient Chinese crossbows certainly like the very early ones they're just a composite bow, like a standard kind of bow that you would use for normal archery mounted onto a stock with mm -hmm. this trigger mechanism that has to be all the way back at the end of the stock because you have to get that full 28 inches of draw to really get your effect out of it. So th mm -hmm. they're really closely overlapping technologies at that time. When, they're, uh, when you're in medieval Europe, they're a bit different, but they definitely kind of, they're used continuously throughout. Uh, both sides use them. And I think we also tend to think of you know, when the longbow makes its big push in the later Middle Ages, we think of it as a distinctly English weapon. So England, there's this kind of, England uses the bow, then it uses the crossbow, then it abandons the bow, crossbow for the bow again. And they kind of seem to do that. Like, they don't completely abandon the crossbow, but it becomes a more tertiary weapon. But in other countries, you see a much more mixed use, uh, particularly in France, you see quite a bit of bows and crossbows used. So they are mm -hmm. used, like, they are kind of overlapping technologies. And they often used together. And a lot of armies would have both of them in it. Um, for guns, we also kind of see this overlap with them. For the first sort of 150 years of guns, so from sort of 1300 to 1450, they're mm -hmm. mostly artillery. So you don't really have the same artillery. There's handguns, but they're very niche experimental weapons. They don't really work very well. So once you get matchlock arquebuses in the mid kind of 15th century, that's when you start to see them kind of fill a similar military role to what the crossbow would use. It's a single person handheld weapon of death at range. But mm -hmm. even then, I mean, the crossbow and the arquebus are used together in many military campaigns, often in mixed regiments, uh, up until the mid 16th century. So there's about a century of them kind of overlapping. And then eventually, 
the archivist replaces the both of them and it's it's just archivist is all the way yeah so what, what are the advantages the crossbow had over traditional bows the advantage disadvantage breakdown really is the crossbow is generally going to be more powerful than a bow there's a bit of room like a lower end a higher end bow and a lower end crossbow will exist in fairly similar spaces but the crossbow has this potential to become extremely powerful uh, whereas the longbow kind of taps out at what's physically possible to draw you know at mm -hmm. a certain point you just can't you can't use that you can build it more powerfully but you can't it's not usable uh, the yeah. other real advantage a crossbow has is that it can stay loaded so when you pull it back into the trigger it just rests there there's no strain on your body so you can keep a shot ready whenever you want this is obviously really important in hunting because you never have to draw your weapon you don't startle the prey by doing that so it's very useful in that but it's also useful in warfare there are situations it's kind of been highlighted a lot of useful in siege warfare where someone might just stick their head up for a second it's great to have your shot ready but it's useful mm -hmm. in that regard and then the bow's real advantage the main advantage is that it's just way faster even i mean the kind of this discussion around how quickly it takes to reload a crossbow it really depends what device you're using with it so it can be very very slow it can be quite a bit faster people tend to picture like the windlass which is this device that you can only shoot about two shots a minute which is really the high end you're shooting a really powerful crossbow with that there are much faster devices but even then they're never as fast as someone going all out with a bow is so that mm -hmm. that bow advantage is there but of course doing that is exhausting so what are some of the biggest misconceptions some people might have about crossbows well aside from the fact they're almost always used by kind of movie villains which i think is everybody <laughs> loves crossbows one of the big myths i think is there's this idea that the crossbow was this easy to use weapon that could be used to kill a knight and as such was kind of frowned upon by european society and part of this is based on this this uh council called the second lateran council in the mid 12th <laughs> century and it issues this ban on the use of crossbows in inter-christian warfare that council is part of a much broader context that tends to be ignored it bans fighting wars on any day that's not like tuesday or wednesday and bans mm -hmm. jousting and it's all about like regulating what the kind of secular lords could get up to and it's basically ignored by them because lords loved crossbows these guys were yeah. mad for them crossbows were great they were a really effective way to kill other people and so the lords were just all in on crossbows a lot mm -hmm. of this is actually rooted in a sort of 16th century objection to the arquebus which we do actually see this idea of like a poorly trained militiaman killing a highly trained elite was a real complaint. Mm -hmm. It's in Don Quixote actually, but they're talking about the arquebus and it's mm -hmm. kind of people apply it backwards thinking, well, the crossbow must've been the arquebus of the 12th century. And it's, it's not really the same. It's very different military content. So can you walk me through kind of the basic design of a crossbow or some of the specific parts and how they operate? Um, what are some of the different mechanisms that have been used throughout the various stages of its evolution and, uh, and kind of the last, last advancements of the crossbow before they're fully replaced. So one of the kind of big ish side debates in crossbow is, is do you, do you have to have a trigger to be a crossbow? Because there's some mm -hmm. people that say that the main feature of a crossbow is that it's a bow mounted horizontally on a stock such that it resembles a cross. And other people say that that's a arrow guide. If it doesn't have a trigger, a trigger is what makes a crossbow. I'm a little agnostic on this. It's much more of a debate if you're kind of talking origins of the crossbow than if mm -hmm. I kind of specialize late medieval and we're all in on crossbows being crossbows. But the main mm -hmm. bits, you need a bow, it's sometimes also called a lathe or a prod. Um, there's some debates about those later terms. Some people think lathes should only be used for steel crossbows. Uh, other mm -hmm. people think that prod is a misspelling from a 16th century text and that we should be using a different. I use bow for the most part, unless I'm also talking about bows, because then it just gets confusing if you're talking about bows and bows, crossbow bows, and it's a bit of a mess. So mm -hmm. you need your bow, you need your stock, which is the piece of wood you mounted it on. You need your trigger mechanism, which is generally based on the, what we call the lock. So mm -hmm. that's where you've mounted your trigger mechanism. The standard European trigger is a rolling nut trigger. So you have this kind of cylinder and it has two kind of claws sticking up. Sometimes it's one claw, usually it's two. And what you do is that catches the string and then there's a big trigger that forms this kind of a Z shape that levers up against the bottom of the nut and stops it from rotating. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to shoot, you pull up the trigger, it releases the pressure, and then the wheel rolls and it goes away and shoots. The traditional Chinese crossbow, which is kind of a, it looks like kind of a door latch, it's made of bronze. And so it kind of has a bit of a, a bigger kind of bronze lock and a bit that sticks up. And there's kind of a lever at the bottom that kind of like you would think of like a really primitive door latch. So you, when yeah. you pull it back, it kind of drops it forward and it shoots. Mm -hmm. There's also the peg trigger, which is a much simpler lock mechanism where you just have basically a groove carved in the stock and the string goes in it. And then when you push the trigger up, it pushes the pin up and releases it. So the kind of features of your crossbow are gonna be dependent a bit on your trigger. So a Z trigger, you have to have a kind of a reinforced lock space because you've carved out a big chunk of your main tiller. So it needs to be reinforced. You have to have your nut in there. You have to have your trigger. For a peg and hole, it's much simpler. 
kind of features. But that's really the main things. You need a bow, you need a stock, and you need a trigger. And then it's, well, how do you want to span your crossbow? Originally, you just put your feet on the bow and you pull it back. That's bad for the bow. Obviously, you don't really want to be standing on it. And it kind of limits your power. One of the first things you start seeing in European crossbows, and to some extent in Chinese ones as well, they added stirrups. In Chinese, they often had, like, they're made of rope versus in um, the early European ones, which have, would be made of metal. So it's like, mm -hmm. a, like a horse riding stirrup on the front of your crossbow. You put your foot into that. And then often what you'd have is you'd have a hook, a metal hook on your belt, which you'd put on the string called a belt hook, understandably. And that allows you to use your legs to span the crossbow as opposed to having to use your arms. So that's a real benefit. You're no longer damaging your bow. You're using your much more powerful leg muscles. And then other devices. So you might have um, the, the windlass, which is like a big winch device, which is used for spanning very powerful crossbows. That tends to have the requirement you have to have quite a long stock for that because you would put this crossbow on the ground, usually with a stirrup as well to hold it steady. And then you have to have it at your kind of chest height where the handles be. So you need the crossbow to be tall enough that when you stick it up there, you can do this. So you're not crouching down to try and span mm -hmm. it. Kranikins are kind of a big gear shaft crank device. It's one of the later spanning devices. Um, they're often associated with Germany, although I think that's more of a stereotype of the Middle Ages rather than actually reflecting. Everyone seems to have used them. Mm -hmm. And that you would need a kind of a lug on, through the crossbow tiller to kind of hold it in place as you're cranking it back. There's also the Krihak, which is like a belt hook, but it uses pulleys in it. So it's a bit more efficient. Um, mm -hmm. And that usually requires a hook on the crossbow step. So you would have a piece of rope that you would hook it on the other end of your crossbow. So you need a hook on it. So those are kind of like the features there are all to taste. And sometimes you'll see crossbows will be modified. So mm -hmm. one thing you find is that sometimes late medieval crossbows, if they wanted to use it, was built for a windlass, they want a Kranikin, they saw off the end of it and they stick a lug through it. So you can, there's a little bit of flexibility there. As to the kind of the last development, I, my favorite last development is, it's extremely niche. This was never mainstream, but it's the mm -hmm. gun crossbow, which is mm -hmm. when they put a wheel lock gun in a crossbow. So really? the earliest of these are about 1500, they're in Venice. And they're some of the earliest surviving examples of wheel locks. So this is a very early phase and kind of invention of the wheel lock. And there's mm -hmm. only maybe a dozen of them. They're all extremely valuable artifacts and they were probably made for very rich people. This is not you know, going out into war with your gun crossbow, but it's a really interesting overlap in the two technologies and a, just a fascinating piece of weird history. So how does that work then? Is it, is she both bolts and a bullet then or? Yeah, so you basically, you have a wheel lock gun with a crossbow mounted on top of it. Mostly mm -hmm. they have separate triggers. Sometimes they might shoot it on the same, off the same trigger. Uh, there's some couple theories about how they're used. The one I like best is from the earliest Phoenician examples, which is that they might have been for bodyguards. Because oh. you kind of want the wheel locks misfired fairly reliably. Like they have kind of a misfiring issue. So the crossbow is like back up redundancy. Like the wheel lock doesn't go, the crossbow will go. And we definitely yeah. get that assassin done. The bow materials, like what difference does it make? Uh, if you use wood, do they use composite and somewhere I know are steel. What are, what are the advantages and disadvantages of those? The classic kind of crossbow is the is made of you. It's very much just like a, a really short stocky longbow same kind mm -hmm. of material same principles and how you would make a like a yourself bow uh, mm -hmm. and as far as i know it we don't really have many examples of other woods being used that's kind of the classic one composite so the the chinese i said they used very similar to the traditional composite bow making process with the kind of the layer you know the wood in the middle the sinew on the back and the the horn of belly uh, yeah. the european composite bows are a little bit weirder so there's kind of there isn't really a consistent pattern to how they do. They use all of those components. They use they use horn, they use wood, and they use sinew. Mm -hmm. But the core doesn't have that same structure where it's always going to be the wood and then the horn along the back. Sometimes you have layers of horn, or you have different types of horn, or something like there's a couple of rare examples that just don't have wood in them. They're just horn, and then you wrap the whole thing in this huge mass of sinew. And mm -hmm. it's one of the bits of the crossbow making I think we don't understand as well. But part of it is that it's hard to know what's in the surviving examples because they don't really you can't really cut them open. You know, there are valuable artifacts from the Middle Ages. And I don't think we've really experimented with like what exactly is going on with these very different kind of ways of structuring it, or even how did they reach this point? Um, mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting bit that like the composite crossbow is actually more different from the bow than you would think. Mm -hmm. And the steel one, so the steel crossbow so comes in in we think probably the 14th century is definitely. Mm -hmm earliest evidence of 4th century. Some historians place it a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, steel crossbows have the advantage of they can become, they can become extremely powerful. Uh, there's some argument that maybe a really well-built composite crossbow could be comparably powerful. 
but steel crossbows seem to be cheaper and faster to make. And mm -hmm. they did have the downside of they're quite heavy, like a big steel chunk of steel at the front of your bow is a much heavier thing to use. Eventually, though, they do become the dominant form of crossbow, but only mm -hmm. after the crossbow ceases to be used in war. So we mm -hmm. see in kind of military uses, there's all three of them. And part of that seems to be U is a bit cheaper. Composite takes a lot of time and effort to make and steel kind of comes in a bit later. And there's also some biases against steel. The Teutonic Knights famously didn't like steel crossbows. And there's a theory yeah. that they were worried they would crack in the winter because the Teutonic Knights actually campaigned a lot in winter, which is unusual for other parts of Europe, but was normal in the Baltic. So there was mm. a, a fear that the, the extra rigidity of the you know, sub-freezing Baltic winter would cause them to shatter. Mm. And you do see there is reinforcements on steel crossbows to make, because they did actually have that problem long-term over time, they could shatter and that was bad. Oh. So, but once we kind of get into the mid 16th century and crossbows are just for sport and hunting and kind of for fun, then you really only see steel crossbows, but you also begin to see a huge diversity of kinds of crossbow, which is interesting because you can make steel really, really big. You can make it really, really small. It's a much more malleable material and kind of what you can do with it than the, uh, the other two. So what kind of uh, draw strength did they get up to? There's been some that have kind of been put up to 1200 pounds. There's wow. an argument that that's probably like a, a team weapon, like a siege, a great crossbow or a siege crossbow. So you get these like big crossbows that three people would use at a time. That would be you'd mount them on like a bench you wouldn't carry them yourself uh, we only have the bow surviving from that though so it's there's a bit of debate but mm -hmm. it's an area we don't have as much data for this as we do for bows unfortunately like we don't have something as valuable as the mary rose where we have just like hundreds of bows we can plot and i think this is an area for really interesting exploration but generally the berkhamsted bow which is a u bow we have from kind of probably the 13th century the dating is mm -hmm. a little difficult on it we think is probably about 150 pounds draw which would be the kind of the lower end. And then yeah. we think probably they're in the, you know, 500 to 600 for a lot of the heavier crossbows. And then we have some of these extreme examples that might be up to a thousand. Another thing to note on that though, is that crossbows are much less efficient than bows. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to, yeah, a bow, a crossbow might be only 40% efficient, whereas a bow might be 80%. So you have oh. to kind of evaluate that on, particularly for the steel crossbows, because those arms are really heavy. And that's where you lose a lot of that energy pushing the bolt forward so they might be 1200 pounds but it might only be 50 percent efficient so you might only be 500 pounds but that's still a lot of pounds crossbows only shoot bolts or do they ever use different types of ammo? so in military use you, you tend to shoot bolts there are different kinds of bolts so the main military ones you have kind of your classic war bolt and then you also have an incendiary bolt where the the metal bit is extra long and you would wrap it in a flammable material and set fire to it because obviously you don't want fire to touch the bow and you shoot mm -hmm. them into it. But then you also have pellet crossbows, which shoot small stones or maybe metal balls. Um, mm -hmm. Origin of these is a little bit debated, but probably late medieval Italy is the best kind of I've seen. Um, and they seem to mostly been for fun, for like light entertainment, kind of like the kids version of an air rifle or like the medieval version of an air rifle. Mm -hmm. You know, you have lots of like kids and women like to use them as well as men and there's I mean there are people who go hunting you hear shooting birds shooting like cans the equivalent of shooting, medieval equivalent of shooting cans so they went through fads as well so like in Italy they, there's a, kind of an early fad in the late middle ages and then you know, they just disappear and then like 50 years later they're really popular in France and then mm -hmm. in, in Victorian uh, England they were hugely popular so there's like kind of their last resurgence in popularity is this Victorian England uh phase where it was just really in to shoot crossbows um yeah so that's kind of the main other one obviously i mentioned bullet cross like gun crossbows which shoot bullets as well as bolts but those are your main types so when it comes to like actually using a crossbow like today we think of a lot of modern firearm terms like shooting uh what, what's the correct terminology when you like shoot a crossbow properly yeah you're shooting it or you're you might say you're loosing it or that feels a bit more air, um bowy i'm a bit agnostic on this some people are really against using fire for crossbows because fire is the ignition of the powder and they don't like using that. I think we've kind of moved on where we just use fire to mean shooting anything. Like if you see someone shooting a trebuchet, they're probably also going to say fire and there's no fire involved in that. So I am I did concede that in my book, I mostly tried to use shoot or loose and avoid using fire to kind of mm -hmm. acknowledge that it is technically incorrect. Yeah. But I'm also like in, in common speech, I use fire all the time. Is there any other terminology that's specific to using a crossbow that you might get wrong? I use span instead of load. So spanning to, to pull the string back. I must people say load the crossbow, but I don't like that. I like 
I kind of imagined like shoving the bowl down the barrel. Like you, you span yeah. the crossbow to prepare it. Were crossbows usually able to penetrate armor? Initially, so chainmail, you would be, you'd have a decent shot of penetrating chainmail. Now, whether mm -hmm. or not you would deliver lethality with that is another matter because often like the layers of armor because you would rest things under your chainmail they're meant to absorb the impact so even if the bolt gets through it might not hit you so we have mm -hmm. sort of uh richard the first who's actually famously later killed by a crossbow on the third crusade is shot on the side by a crossbow but is only minorly grazed so like, it goes through his armor but it doesn't go far enough to actually give really him a serious wound but you do have other people who are shot and killed by crossbows and so it, it does it is fairly consistent and not always rely 100% guaranteed once you get to plate armor it's a much more dubious prospect to penetrate plate armor generally what you see is missile weapons at that stage kind of form a support role they're more for disruption because even if like you're in full plate armor and someone shoots you in the head with a crossbow bolt it's probably not going to penetrate your armor but it is like someone threw a big rock at your head like it's a mm -hmm. lot of force and if some if they're just doing that consistently it's really uncomfortable. You might get bruises. If you're just standing there under fire, it's really hard. So it was often used to disrupt formations, to cause them like mental strain and make them, by the time the two sides clashed, one of them is just like way less up for it than the other mm -hmm. one. So when you're kind of exhausted and tired and battered already, by the time you hit the enemy lines, you're much less prepared to actually defeat them in the melee. How long would it usually take to like train with the crossbow versus the traditional bow? One of the big things with the crossbow or the bow is that you need a certain level of physical fitness to shoot a large bow. So to build that physical fitness is gonna take you time in a way that a crossbow doesn't necessarily take. Like I could probably take someone out to a field and teach them to shoot a crossbow reasonably competently over a couple of days. Versus if you wanna build that muscle mass to shoot a 120 pound longbow, that's, we're talking a much longer investment and it's gonna involve a lot of practice because the best way to build the muscle mass for shooting a longbow is to shoot longbows, you know? So there's a lot of that practice, but at the same time, we do see that practicing with crossbows was a huge thing. You know, there's famously, there's these ordinances in England that restrict sports activities and say, you have to be practicing your, your longbow. Don't be going out and playing football. And we do actually see those things in medieval France. In 14th and 15th century France, starting with King Charles V, you start to see similar bands come in where they say like, don't be doing sport, be shooting your bows or your crossbows. We have to mm -hmm. defeat the English. Basically, that's kind of the subtext. And then we also have these things called archery guilds, which aren't really conventional guilds. They're more like fraternities or associations that are in most of the major cities across all of Europe. And mm -hmm. these people got together, they shot, they had local competitions, they competed in other cities and competitions, and they took their archery and their crossbow shooting very seriously. So there mm -hmm. is definitely a high training threshold for both of them. And, and people who are out serving in these militaries will often be fairly well trained in both of them. So what kind of range did you get with like a crossbow versus a traditional bow? You're looking at maybe 200 yards, reasonable mm -hmm. range, lethal or effective range is a lot, lot shorter than that. At maximum range, your longbow is going to be better than your crossbow. And a big part of that is really the fletching. So longbows, or as you're probably aware, they're fletched with goose feathers. You'd have three veins usually. Crossbow mm -hmm. bolts, for military use are often not fletched at all. Oh. Uh, they're much heavier and stockier and you just kind of tend to shoot them and you didn't get as much value out of the fletching as you did out of the longer arrow. Mm. Uh, for target shooting or maybe sometimes for military use, if they weren't like the, not fletching them was much cheaper, obviously. So if they were spending a bit more, they would often have two veins on uh, opposite sides made of things like paper or parchment or sometimes bronze. And so you're, even in those cases, you're not going to get the same, that'll help with the accuracy, but it's not going to have that same kind of lift potential as shooting a big arc with a longbow is. Now, how effective that is in military use or hunting use is very debatable. So it's more like if you're out shooting, you know, for field archery or competitions, that kind of distance, you'll achieve it much better with a longbow than with a crossbow, but at kind of like shorter lethal range where you're just shooting flat at a target, they're fairly comparable. Expense wise, like, how does that compare to like build your own crossbow versus a regular bow? Crossbows are more expensive. Uh, we don't have like, a, I think there is actually probably quite a lot of pricing data out there that we could really dig into, but I don't think anyone has done it yet to exactly say like, this is how much it costs, this is how much it costs. But generally crossbows are more expensive. And one of the things you see as a consequence of that is that crossbowmen are better paid than archers because mm -hmm. how much you got paid in medieval warfare was often really dependent upon how expensive was your kit. You know, like how much did it cost for you to come into the field and have all this stuff? And the crossbowmen tended to wear better armor and they tended to have more expensive weapons. Hmm. So it's 
you're not really going to encounter peasants with crossbows generally like it's more of a an urban weapon where there's a bit more money coming ar around yeah uh, or people who would be serving in fairly well-paid jobs in local manners or like in service to their lord so it's a slightly higher status weapon in terms of your financial level than the, the bow when it comes to like actual warfare like how how were crossbows generally used i think you mentioned that they're oftentimes used with bows even uh what, what how yeah how, how would that usually work so in so late medieval warfare you kind of have two ways you're going to use a lot of your missile weapons one of them is kind of the, the famous english way that is very associated with them because it's used in the kind of string of victories at crecy and poitiers and at Agincourt, which is this weapon of kind of disruption where you have these crossmen kind of scattered around your men at arms and you use your your missile weapons to disrupt the enemy formation and also to make them attack because being the attacker particularly in that era where you're all fighting on foot is worse because you don't want to have to march through the mud to get to them because then you're tired and you mm -hmm. don't there's greater chance of losing your formation and so the, the missile the missiles were very useful in that way and you also might get maiming or injuring blows so i said like you're not likely to penetrate a helmet you're not likely to penetrate a breastplate those are the thicker parts of the armor but arms and legs that's thinner armor especially mm -hmm. if you're a plate so you might you know, you might get lucky, you might get a, a penetrating shot. They're often designed to cause glancing blows. So you kind of got to get that lucky shot, but you know, you're going to lose people that way. You might not be dead for taking a bolt to the leg. Joan of Arc famously took a bolt straight through her leg and survived, but mm -hmm. you know, you're out of commission if that happens too. The other big way to use them is to kind of skirmish in advance of the army. So you see this a lot in French armies um, in the sort of 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. And then it's so, it was so well known that the historian at the time, medieval historian Matthew Paris once wrote that um, the crossbowmen lead the way to describe how an army would march. So they would be used to, to march in like in advance of the army reaching the battle, they'd be a screening mm -hmm. troop. And then also beforehand, they would advance, they would skirmish with the other side's archers and then hopefully try and soften up the other side before the cavalry come in. And so their kind of job is to deliver the cavalry charge as best they can. And you see that a lot in crusader warfare, that they would try and keep Muslim horse archers at bay and then try and set up for the big glorious charge to come in. So it's to maximize the, the effect of the knights. Well, you talked a little bit about the, the use of crossbows in hunting. Do you want to talk any more about how crossbows are used outside of war? Yeah, so they're a very popular hunting weapon. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit frustrating about trying to get how they were used at hunting is that most of the stuff written about medieval hunting by people in the Middle Ages is obviously by the social elite. And they're like way more interested in how they use their hunting dogs or this like you know, the kind of the posture side of hunting and less into like how you use crossbows. So we know very little about how, you know, your average person would go out and hunt with a bow or a crossbow, which is a little mm -hmm. bit frustrating because they definitely would have been used by that. I mean, I said that, you know, the crossbow is a slightly posture weapon, but like, you know, poachers aren't necessarily, it's just someone who's on hard times now. They might still have had been in better times before and they might have crossbows. So we know that some, some of them must have been used for that. Uh, there's interesting examples of things like, they were probably popular with bear hunting because you would obviously you don't hunt bears for meat, but that was a very popular sport. And a lot of it was that you would corner the bear and then you would shoot at it for a while to soften it up before anybody went near it with a weapon because you don't mm -hmm. want to be approaching the bear with just like a stick. Um, yeah. Another popular thing I mentioned, the, the guilds. So they were shooting competitions were very popular. The classic one was called the Popinjay, where you erect this big pole in the middle of your town square and at the top you had a little bird called the popinjay and the goal was to shoot the bird off the pole so you'd have everyone come around and they all take turns trying to shoot up at the the pole and knock it off and some of the competitions would be more elaborate so you'd have like a, it'd be multiple sections so if you knocked off like the wing you would get like a smaller prize and then the biggest prize was whoever knocked off the final top of the bird and then you also had competitions where it would just be like a straight target shoot like we would think of they would set up targets and they would publish beforehand rules about like how big your bolts could be and tell you how big the targets would be. And it would be a sheet of paper that would say like, your bolts can't be any bigger round than this. And the target's gonna be this big. And we've copied it exactly. And this is what we do. And you would shoot into the into the targets. Hmm. So and those all remained very popular. And Pop and Jay shooting was popular into the 18th century. The, Dres the court at Dresden with the kind of nobles there was really into Pop and Jay shooting into the modern era. and. It was kind of seen as a great way to practice with the crossbow and then later just as a great pastime on its own big festival. Everyone free beer would often be provided by the city 
So, you know, you can imagine no work, everybody drinks. Let's go shoot some crossbows. What could go wrong? When exactly did crossbows kind of that era end? So it's kind of a sliding scale. This is one of the things I really tried to dig into for my book. And I kind of had to give up partway through because I think I've not found the last example. But the 16th century is really the decline of the crossbow. So you, you see that them cease to be dominant at that point. The French military largely stops using them in the 1530s, sometime during the Italian wars. We don't know exactly when, but it seems to be around then. In Sweden, they hang on a bit longer. They're in use until the 1550s. And even a bit later, um, there's some instances in kind of late 16th century warfare where they have hard time supplying gunpowder. And so they go back and they pull out the crossbows again. Uh, and there's another good example. So in the Se Great Siege of Malta in 1565, which is what I picked as like the final battle of the age of the crossbow, because I think it's dramatic and interesting. But then this is this big siege where the Ottomans have come to Malta to besiege, to stop the Knights Hospitaller have been relocated there to because mm. basically to wipe them off the face of the map and get access to the uh, western mediterranean and it ends up failing disasterly but, but towards the end of the siege uh the rainy season starts and there's like pouring rain at the end of august and the hospitalers all go back into their armory and they put all their guns away and they pull out all the crossbows and they go out, they go to the walls and they start shooting with crossbows and it's this dramatic mm. story and the bits of evidence suggest they were probably using crossbows the whole time, but it's this really like lovely, lavish end of the crossbow. Um, but it's still used, like we know there was Spanish conquistadors brought crossbows with them and often used crossbows and arquebuses in equal numbers in their wars in South America. Hmm. And there's they kind of crop up every so often. There's some really like weird examples, like in World War One, some German soldiers looted some museums in the Netherlands and rigged up some early modern crossbows to shoot grenades. Oh. And so like there was only like you know, maybe half a dozen of people doing this, but it does kind of pop up in wars later. Like you kind of have these odd examples where like, well, the crossbow is not quite, it's not quite gone. Yeah. And then obviously for hunting, it's still popular. So as a, as a sport yeah. weapon, it's it's never really fallen out of style. So it was kind of the the uh, introduction of gunpowder that eventually mostly causes it. So kind of, well, the big change is gunpowder becoming cheap enough. So mm -hmm. early gunpowder was just, making saltpeter was really hard. No one knew how to make saltpeter initially, so all your saltpeter had to be imported from Asia. That was outrageously expensive. Eventually, around 1400, some places in Germany figure out how to make saltpeter. And so that helps, but it still doesn't really meet the demand of Europe. And also always has that risk that like you can't really declare war with those parts of Germany if you want to use guns because they're your supply of gunpowder. <laughs> so it's only really once you start seeing more and more widespread access to saltpeter and making it much more affordable. Because early on, saltpeter cost more than any other part of the gun process. Guns were cheap. Saltpeter was expensive. Oh. So it was really that access to gunpowder that was a key kind of limiter on the, the adoption of guns for quite a while. So in the 16th century, you start to see people kind of lean in more. They're more confident that their supply of gunpowder is available, but they can, mm. they can kind of go all in on arquebuses. And it's controversial. Uh, in the 1590s, England retired the longbow, and it was controversial. Like, there were pamphlet wars. Some people thought they shouldn't be doing it. And so it was, it was a hotly contested issue. Hmm. Interesting. But what were some of the advantages with firearms when they started to, to emerge versus the crossbow? Guns are just way more powerful. So there's an interesting study that this guy, Tom Richardson, who's a uh, curator at the Royal Armories, uh, did a few years, it was a good few years back, but he kind of took, he made a bunch of replica weapons. He started actually a, back at like thrown spears and atlatls and worked his way up to early guns modeled on the guns in the Mary Rose. And the guns are just an order of magnitude more powerful. I mean, early gunpowder, even with kind of the more primitive gunpowder techniques that they would mm -hmm. have used, is just significantly more lethal than anything mm -hmm. a bow or a crossbow can maintain. Now, there are downsides that come with that. Um, they, they're slower to reload. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with issues like barrels fouling up, which means they're going to get slower to reload over the mm -hmm. course of battle. That was a huge issue with the eventual introduction of rifling, but it's a problem with any of these guns. The accuracy issue can be quite big. So the, the kind of famous smooth bore gun issue is that they're really inaccurate. Part mm. of that is true. A lot of it comes down to how closely your ammunition fits to your barrel. Because if it's a really tight fit, you're going to be more accurate than something like the Brown Best Musket famously, the ball kind of rattles around inside of it. It's really inaccurate. But then if it's really tight fit, that fouling up becomes a problem much sooner because any that like kind of issue in that gun is going to cause it to not be able to load. So it has all these kind of complications. Then you have to deal with the fact that once the smoke starts entering the battlefield, it, you know, it introduces this whole new level of chaos to the war because you can no longer see where your enemy is or what's going on. So it has all these kind of extra complications. But for all that, 
it kills people way better. I mean, it will go straight through plate armor. So, mm. which is one of the reasons why you see like the kind of classic conquistador image. He's got this big helmet and a breastplate and nothing else. And it's, they mm. ditched all the arms because that just didn't provide any protection. So then it's just weighing you down and you thicken the breastplate and you thicken the helmet in the hopes that it'll stop some of that. Hmm. All right, well, thanks again for doing this interview. Uh, Want to talk briefly about your book? Yeah, thanks for having me. So the medieval crossbow weapon fit to kill a king uh, named in part for the Richard I, who I mentioned previously, who was killed by a crossbow bolt, uh, is a kind of a new introductory history of the crossbow. The kind of main book, if you go on, you want to buy a history of the crossbow is this book by Sir Ralph Payne Galway. And it's quite good, but it's also from 1903. So it's a little, it's been a little while since someone wrote a new one. So it's hopefully introduces a lot of new elements of the crossbow. And I think what I want is to also pose a lot of questions to show what we don't know. And if you are someone who's interested in the crossbow, it'll answer a lot of questions, but it'll also show you that maybe if you want to dig a little deeper and you want to find something that to research on your own, there's a lot of room there in crossbow studies. It's not a big field right now. And there's a lot that I would love to know more of. Uh, mm -hmm. It's published with pen and sword books. If you're in Europe, It'll come out on the 30th of May, and you can order it directly from the publisher. They're doing a 20% off discount for till as pre-order. If you're in North America, it's going to come out at the start of August. And it's on Amazon, it's on Barnes & Noble's website, or you could contact your local independent bookseller and see if they'll get it for you.